that we share a commitment to contributing our very best work to the people we serve in the most difficult conditions. How many of you remember a time before Sphere? I do. A few of us. Kind of dates us, but that's all right. I do remember. And I remember the first time I used Sphere, really used Sphere. I was in Northern Liberia, early 2000s. Nearly 50,000 people were displaced in the face of active conflict, and they were walking down the road towards our child protection center. We had to help. We had to provide food, water, shelter, immediately. Where did I turn? I was a generalist. Well, I was a child protection specialist, but for these areas, I was really a generalist. Where did I turn? To Sphere, to the handbook. And I know this is what made the difference on that day. The revision of the handbook is always a unique moment in our community. It's a time to reflect on practice. We spend a lot of time thinking about process and policy, and that's important. But it's also important to carve out that time to think about what our practice is, what we agree must be done to save lives and restore dignity. We can challenge ourselves with evidence and learning and move the bar forward for the people that we serve. Indeed, this revision has been the most inclusive and far-reaching in Sphere's history. Drawing on local, national, regional, and global practice, we saw consultations in more than 40 countries and online contributions drawing on professionals working in nearly 200 organizations in 65 countries. Fully one-third of the participants came from national organizations, national authorities, national service providers, who gave of their time, energy, resources to contribute their voice to this discussion. More than half of the consultations were organized by voluntary sphere focal points working in their own communities. This is your handbook, your tool, your community. Thank you for being here. But most importantly, thank you all for being part of this very important work on our collective behalf. A special thanks goes to the Sphere Board. Many of you are here today former and current, to our outgoing president, Martin McCann, to our incoming president, Colin Rogers, and thank you to the Sphere members, especially to the focal points who gave so much of their time and leadership in local engagement. We have the luck of having several of our lead authors here with us today as well. Uni Krishnan, Ella, she gives me a hard time, Sir Dargal. <laughs> I apologize in advance. And Daniel Ganga from World Vision International. Can I ask you to please stand up? It's important for us to recognize those who did that work. Uni, Daniel, Ella, and for the organizations that gave their time to this effort. Thank you to all the contributors on behalf of the entire sector. Many of you I know were part of reference groups and other review groups. PHAP and Translators Without Borders were important partners, and we thank you for the support that you provided during the consultation, the editing of this immense work. A special thanks as well to Group URD and to the CHS Alliance for their strong collaboration and leadership on the revision of the core humanitarian standard, which, prom which is prominently figured now in the handbook. And the donors who supported this global and ambitious undertaking, of course. The German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, OFDA, PRM, Irish Aid, Australian DFAT, ECHO, CETA, and DENITA. And special thanks to Swiss Development and Corporation for hosting us in this immense room today. The acknowledgments are indeed long, and I invite you to look inside your handbooks to have the full listing of all those with thanks. This is an immense collective effort, which will shape our work and set the bar for a new generation of humanitarians around the world. Congratulations to you all. You get a congratulations. I'd like to now invite you to watch a brief video from our authors, and then we'll turn over the rest of our program to Heba Ali of Iran, who will be our moderator for the rest of the afternoon.
Yeah, the first time I came across Sphere was when I was working for Oxfam in the 1990s when the first handbook, the first version of the Sphere was being developed. That's when uh, Sphere was really coming up uh, and was being used as reference and we were actually being held to account through the standard. I think Sphere has been quite an amazing phenomenon uh, in a way. Sphere was making a case why people, affected people, are perhaps the most important variable in any humanitarian response and especially giving them a voice. When we first sort of started pre-Sphere, I don't think we had that commonality of language which made, which made it so much more difficult. Uh, Sphere really became the voluntary uh, commitments around the world and it has been like sort of like a movement rather than just a tool. I don't really remember a time before Sphere. Um, and I don't think there are too many people who are still working in the sector who do. It's become so much part of the conversation. I would say the go-to manual on what we should be doing. And the reach that Sphere has um, is quite incredible. Welcome everyone and um, it's great to be here. We at IRIN, as many of you know, uh, see accountability towards people affected by crises as a central part of why we do what we do. We are journalists who often see the results of a failure of standards to be upheld and much broader failures of the humanitarian system. So for me, I come at this conversation through the lens of um, not just technical standards, but more broadly, what it takes to ensure that people who are affected by crises um, get the help that they deserve and have a right to receive. So we're going to kick off uh, this afternoon with a look at um, Sphere Then and Sphere Now, uh, given it's the 20th anniversary. And we have with us, if technology will... Um, support us, Peter Walker, who is the co-founder of Sphere. Is Peter on the line? I am online. Can you hear me? Oh, wonderful. Hi, Peter. Have your photo. Great. Nice to be here. Okay, we can't see you, but we can hear your voice from above, so that, that will do. Okay, well, I'm sure that one of the techies can make the, uh, the video thing work. The, the almighty Peter Walker from on high. <laughs> oh, there he is. There he is. Hi, Peter. So, as I mentioned, Peter, Peter founded or co-founded Sphere back in 1997. Christine Knudsen is the director, executive director of Sphere today. And we just wanted to spend a little bit of time reflecting on how it has evolved over the years and where it needs to go next. Um, so, Peter, I thought I'd start with you. It was 1996, just after the Rwandan genocide. Uh, can you walk us through the conditions in which Sphere was born? Yeah. Um, first of all, I must admit, 20 years seems to have gone very fast, and it just makes me feel ancient. Uh, but there you go. We all get older. Uh, so really, if you think back to the mid-90s, it, it came at a time when humanitarianism had sort of been released from the, the straitjacket of the, the Cold War period where it very much was a sort of little, almost like a sugared add-on to foreign policy. And there was a sense that uh, by the mid-90s, there was more freedom for humanitarian actors, and, and in many ways, their voice carried more weight because there was less certainty in other areas of um, foreign policy action. And I think the thing that really struck all of us who were working at that time was that the old notion that humanitarian action was essentially a, an action of compassion was good, but simply wasn't enough. It, it didn't have the legs to take you through the next 20 years. And so what we were really aiming to do was to say, well, how can we be like, and in a sense, any other service-oriented provider to society, whether these are teachers or doctors or, or, or dentists or engineers. And what you really have there are two things. You have a sense that you should be driven by universal rights, that it really doesn't matter where people live or when they live, they have the same rights. And that you should be driven by an absolute commitment to professionalism, 
in the sense that what you do must be based on evidence, not just on a hunch or belief. And you've really got to show that what you do has effect. Uh, it's not about your ego. It's not about the profitability of your organization. It's pride providing service to those who are most in need uh, at a time when there are little other alternatives. So I think that was really the, 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 the starting impetus for it. Um, yeah, so let's take it from there. So I should note that Peter is now the dean at the Falk School of Sustainability at Chatham University, which is why he's joining us remotely via Skype from Pennsylvania. So thanks, Peter, for, for um, coming all the virtual way. Um, I guess just to follow up on, on where you left off. So yes, we've seen that shift from you know this generosity kind of mentality around aid and certainly um, a professionalization from the Wild West, as some have referred to it, that used to exist, where aid workers would hop on the back of a of a truck with gorillas, and you know where there was very little governing this space. Um, what shift has, or what difference has that shift made from what you've seen? That professionalization, for better and and for worse. Well, I think for better, certainly what I saw until I sort of moved back into this sort of slightly more upstream role of sustainability was that the, the quality of deliverance was better. Uh, you, were, you were getting programs which weren't just hit and miss, where there was a sense that you, know, you knew what had to be delivered. And Christine was talking about this earlier. Even if you weren't an expert, at least you had some guidelines you could follow. At least you had some standards that you could work with to apply. And in many ways, that also means that agencies became more accountable. Um, there were standards against which they could be held accountable, whether that's by the population you're serving or by your donors or by the general public. So I think that's the upside of it. The downside, I think, comes in many fields when you professionalize. It, you, you really have to watch that you get the balance right between this becoming a as we're an expression of just somebody's wish to control knowledge and control a subject and, and effectively it becomes theirs almost in the way that uh, professions can become guilds uh, and using it for good. So you, it's really about keeping people's egos in check uh, and making sure that you're using the profession or the professional attitudes to improve service and not just to craft a little cheeky club uh, as happened, say, in the medical profession up to about the late 1960s, yeah? And I think, I think that is exactly the risk, right, where we see that as the sector professionalizes, aid workers become more and more that little cliquey club, as you described it, and more interested in some cases in the machinery, the bureaucracy, the pay scales, the benefits, the all the rest of it, and in, in what at least we see on the ground in some cases lost track of um, I should correct that, not really on the ground. In fact, many of the field workers are still committed, but certainly in, in the way the bureau functions, that um, in, in some cases lost track of the initial uh, solidarity that underpinned a lot of uh, aid work. Yeah, but you know, that happens with any organization as it grows old and it grows bigger, it basically becomes middle-aged and starts to worry about its health, uh, you know, and so it introduces, you know, these systems that keep it going. Uh, whether you're a university or you're a, a movement or you're a professional body, that happens. And I think the trick is to constantly have people who challenge that. Um, you know, the old adage that business as usual just doesn't cut it, it is just totally true. Every field needs to keep on evolving, and we need people within the humanitarian movement who challenge the way it works, because that, that's the only way you remain true to your values, yeah? So I want to turn to Christine. I mean, one of the other shifts that we've seen is that humanitarianism now isn't just about the immediate saves lives. And whereas I think, Peter, when when you first uh, started the Sphere Standards, it was really, you know, those first 90 days of an emergency that that were the kind of make or break, and now we're seeing humanitarians day in and day out for decades in the same crisis zone. So how do the standards try to tackle these wider questions that are now emerging in humanitarianism, um, not only around what we were just discussing in terms of, um, you know, ensuring that there's still that human 
connection as part of this work, that it's not just technical standards, but also that it's not just about saving lives, it's about building black, it's about dignity, it's about promoting social justice. How, how did the standards tackle that? In different ways. <laughs> so I, I think that we don't want to, it is, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that it is still important to maintain that capacity to save lives in rapid onset, to have impartial and neutral assistance in the face of conflict, and realize that the average duration of displacement now is generational. So what are we thinking about, not only the minimums, but the standards themselves? As you and I were talking earlier, um, it's not about 15 liters of water. It's about adequate and equitable access to water that is safe and available. And this is where we see that a number of development actors also bring it into their work. And we look at what the minimums are, what the quantities are, what our indicators are, how we're going to measure progress in context. And I think that's really what we have to keep in mind very much, that we can't say a minimum for every context, right? We know that the phases change. We know that the actors change. We know that the needs change. We know that people's priorities change. And as professionals, we need to be able to adapt to that. Very few of us leave after 90 days. Very few of us leave after even longer, six, nine, 12 months. We owe it to the understanding that we need to understand priorities. We have to understand priorities of people that we serve. We have to be able to respond to that in an evolving way. And one of the things that we tried to do in this handbook with, uh, with a lot of urging from others was to make sure we put an emphasis on that continuous understanding, that continuous analysis, that understanding that the context and the priorities will change over time, sometimes quickly, sometimes less quickly, but we also have spikes of need. We have seasonal requirements. We have seasonal vulnerabilities. We have to be professional in understanding that analysis. But how can standards that are, uh, as much as you will dispute me, technical in nature, govern things like participation, like inclusion, some of these um, things that are impossible to quantify, at, but that are such a priority in the discussions of the humanitarian sector today? Well, um, in a few different ways, because the technical standards are informed by the foundational pieces that cut across all sectors. The humanitarian charter with the ethical and legal framework, the protection principles which guide all sectoral interventions, not just protection specialists, but really that protection lens we all need to bring into our work, and of course the core humanitarian standard which underpins organizational responsibilities and being fit for that kind of an approach. Those aspects inform the technical standards and ground the technical standards in ethics and accountability. Then we have the technical standards, which now have indicators which uh, do urge us to measure levels of satisfaction, levels of use, levels of application, so that we're not simply quantifying around uh, the numbers that we can see, but what is the use of the latrines? What is the use of the water points? How are we going to be observing that and influencing that in our analysis as well to know if we're making progress against the standards. So they're technical in nature, but all of them include that kind of observation as well. Peter, uh, jump in, of course, um, as we go along, although that might be <laughs> difficult from your um, floating virtual space, but um, the standards were established very much through a voluntary framework. And today, um, and we have representatives of, of DFID here and many other governments that in the age of uh, Me Too are, are pushing quite hard safeguarding and more structured approaches to ensuring that um, aid agencies are um, required to uphold certain standards. Do, does that kind of voluntary framework that still represents the essence of Sphere still stand in today's world? do you think? I think it's the starting point. I mean, I'm, I'm very conflicted about this because in the early days, I was part of a group that wanted something that was less voluntary, where we actually devised mechanisms where if you signed up, you are also signing up to an understanding that you would be held accountable and that there would be consequences of not meeting uh, the performance standards. I think the biggest problem is of saying, so who are you going to be accountable to as an aid agency? 
And how is that body then going to exercise its accountability? And then we all say, you know, the politically correct thing is I'm accountable to the beneficiaries, right? Well, that's, that's great politically. How would they then exercise that accountability? What's the, what's the, if you like, fair and democratic mechanism that they would use, uh, particularly in an emergency situation and in a, in a world where you're working across many different countries with many different cultures? Uh, maybe it needs a third party. Maybe it's, a, it's something like an ombudsman system. And again, that was explored in the early 90s. I think where I'm at now, because in many ways we're doing a similar thing around sustainability standards, um, you know, how do you build economies that are more robust and don't lead to famines and civil wars? Uh, it's very difficult to see how you make enforceable standards that by definition cut across most of the types of political bodies you would use to enforce those standards. So it's almost a catch-22, you know, I think there should be some more robust form of accountability. I just don't see it yet how you would create that mechanism. And when we talk about um, the, the ability to exercise that accountability, Christine, the, the standards tell you what to do, but obviously it's the application that makes or breaks it. Um, what the standards don't necessarily do is say how to empower the affected populations to kind of pick up that handbook and understand their rights and then um, be able to exercise them. So where do you see um, the, the handbook kind of fitting into the empowerment piece and, and is there something missing there that, that would be a future phase? Uh, absolutely. There's, there's uh, been a number of people from affected communities who have been contributing to this process and actually challenging us in a lot of ways, especially in the uh, in the European movements, in the Mediterranean movements. We've had uh, unsolicited calls for, please tell us how this picture is meeting your standards. And it's been a real challenge to us to think about how do we react to that and how do we share that back with operational actors so that there's a feedback loop for those folks. Because the information is in the public domain. Sometimes it's more accessible, sometimes it's less accessible, and that's one of the things we have to really think about and we're thinking very deeply about about now. So that part of that is simplifying the language already in this handbook so that we can simplify those messages further and share them more readily. We've had a, a number of reflections on how do we move from using things like standards or using things like assessment to extract information because honestly that's what we often do is extract information so that how we can do our work better as opposed to empowering so that people understand that there are rights and there are opportunities and there are real mechanisms and an accountability framework where they can exercise their own rights. And this is sometimes a little controversial um, because I can say not recently, but in not so distant past, uh, I've worked for organizations who said don't share these standards with people because we know we're going to have a hard time meeting them and we don't want to create too high of expectations. My answer to that is, well, look, this is rights-based, and we have an obligation to have that conversation with people when we know that rations may be cut, when we know that water systems may not be fully functional, and we have to find solutions together to meet those needs within those resource constraints as well. So being afraid of that level of accountability and that level of engagement, I, I find that really difficult to understand, but it's very prominent. Using this framework, which is common commonly understood and commonly agreed as a foundation for that conversation, I think is, is a very helpful way forward. We need better tools to do that. So I guess one of the big gaps, and it's something I'm sure I'll come back to throughout the conversation, is that, so you, you know, there's the scenario where people who are affected by these crises don't even know that they have the right to X, Y, or Z. And then you have the scenario where people who are affected by crises have no one helping them at all, in which case the standards have you know, it's not about did, did we deliver 15 liters of water or seven, it's that there's no one there delivering water in the first place. So I don't know, Peter, how, when you, when you look, if you look at the biggest failings of the system today in places like Syria or Central African Republic and the remote areas where people are left to fend for themselves, how do these, you know, how does the accountability discussion change? So I think your starting point has got to be the, the biggest failure 
is not with the aid agency the biggest failure is the government that's responsible for that territory. Because that, that is, you know, 60% of the point of governments is to protect its population. And so with you're looking at Syria, you know, it's the Syrian government that is not exercising its responsibility. And aid agencies are trying to take up the, the slack, as it were. A lot of your responsibility, I think, when you're delivering service like this, is not necessarily the responsibility to deliver, to use that standard 15 liters of water per day. It's to act competently and professionally. So just like school teachers do not deliver straight A grades in every student that they deal with, and doctors do not save every life they try to they, they intervene with, uh, where they fall foul of standards is if they have been ne negligent or incompetent. And I think that's really what we uh, were trying to get at with Sphere, was how can we change it so that it is expected that agencies are competent and are not negligent. And, you know, we used to joke back in the old days that we'll know we'll, we've succeeded when we see, I don't know, a bunch of Somali migrants taking out a class action suit against agencies for their negligence. I don't know if it's happened yet. Is, uh, sorry, what? It hasn't happened? I don't think so, but um, that would show you in some ways that the standards have come of age. If somebody thinks they're sufficiently robust, they, they can actually use them in a court of law. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm getting sure there are some um, accountability gurus in the room. I saw Ed uh, Schenkenberg here earlier, but the question of kind of collective accountability, collective performance. So yes, it's one thing to say were the aid agencies negligent um, in the operations that they had around the airport in uh, Mogadishu, for example. Mm -hmm. It's we have no way of holding them to account for uh, negligence, if you want to put it, in not even bothering to be present in some of the more difficult areas where most of the needs actually exist. And I know that's a kind of a much broader discussion, but I suppose I guess what I'm asking is what are the limits of these kinds of standards and what they can, in what they it's can a, it's, really, it's really a question of, of professional associations. Um, the limits are the limits you set. You, any group of aid agencies can decide that it wishes to have more teeth to this. It doesn't matter whether you're two agencies or 200, you can say from now on we wish to be held and we will be held to a higher standard and we will build those mechanisms in, uh, mechanisms to improve our standards and mechanisms to police them. Uh, that's what professional associations do, right? Uh, and that's what trade associations do uh, in, in any field. So that's really the issue. Is there a group of agencies that want to take that next step uh, and voluntary say we will go further than we've gone in the past? And I know this has been discussed around and around for ages, um, and it comes up against, well, will it affect our funding? How will the donors feel? What if we do this and nobody else does? But at some point, you've got to take the leap of faith and just lead on it, yeah? I don't know, of the agencies in the room, are there are many of you willing to go further and self-impose higher standards on you, yourselves? Show of hands. There, no one's raising Let their the hand, Let the record Peter. show. <laughs> <laughs> um, Christina, just a, a last, uh, perhaps or second to last question for you around kind of where we go from here. So the, the, this new handbook has governed or covers a, a number of areas that past handbooks haven't from, or at least kind of strengthened standards around urban crises, around cash-based responses, around responding to pandemics, some of the new threats that um, have been facing the sector. What are the, the next threats that a future handbook is going to have to start covering. Um, wh where are the, the gaps as you see them for the future? Well, uh, like so many things on this on this earth, we're always fighting the last war. Um, we're always responding to what we know has happened before with an idea that that will help us predict what happens next. Um, I think there's one thing to, to emphasize here that there's a lot of emerging conversations, but we can only kind of set the benchmarks where evidence and practice and experience has accumulated to the point that we can consider that they are standards which are commonly held and commonly understood in the sector. 
So predicting where we go next, I think one of the questions that has come up and, and conversations we've been having is um, our changing world of connectivity and what this means. And it just doesn't mean technology, but thinking about if we have the right to food and water and shelter and health, we also have rights to information. And information to govern our own uh, choices, our, to govern, govern our own ability to do um, things that must be done. And I think this idea of information um, being considered as a right, not just participation, but actual information and access to information. Somebody said, what about, what's your standard for access to the internet? Well, we don't have one, but this is one of those questions that is also out there and, and emerging. And I think that there's a lot of reflection going on around this. It's not just our right to information from people, but what is, what is the right that people have information to govern and inform their own decisions? And how do they access that? And how do we make that access safe? And so there's a lot of things, not just around data protection standards, but that work has been done and there's excellent work that has been done. But really, what does this mean in practice and what would that look like as a standard? So I think that's definitely a way that we're going. Um, and if I were to predict the next handbook, there would be a chapter on that. The other thing I'd throw into the mix, uh, I was recently um, at a meeting here in Geneva of humanitarians and climate scientists looking at the intersection of the two and, and the implications that climate change will have for humanitarians. But one of the issues that was kind of on the periphery was the carbon footprint that humanitarians have. And I wonder if in some future handbook that might be something that you would also want to start putting some standards around what is the, you know, the environmental sustainability of our operations as humanitarians. So there is a, a, a new prominence in environmental sustainability, and I know that Peter will want to say something about this, but in the handbook, uh, specifically around shelter and settlement, to think about the footprint of that settlement, to think about the implications of the waste and the packaging, to think about uh, recycling, to think about water use, to think about rationalizing some of that environmental sustainability at a settlement level. I think you're probably right in thinking that at a system level, that's another aspect that we have to get pretty serious about pretty fast. Peter, feel free to comment on that, but I'd also love to just hear from you as, as we close this session. And I mean, it's very easy to be cynical, and I do it all the time, um, and I'm sure everyone in this room is quite used to hearing me um, be exactly that, but uh, I suppose there, has, <laughs> there is, it's also important to recognize when progress is done, and I'd just love to hear from you what you're most proud of in terms of the legacy around accountability, looking at where we are today compared to where we were when you first started working on this. Gosh, well, that's a difficult question. I think probably what I'm most proud of is the way Sphere has grown. When we started it, uh, I can remember that we had a real hard time convincing Oxfam publications to publish the Sphere handbook. They basically said, oh, it'll, we'll never make a profit on it. Uh, we'll publish it if you'll pay us to publish it. And it now exists in how many different languages? And it's kept going for 20 years. So I think that's probably the proudest thing, that not what we did, but that the humanitarian community has taken it, run with it, improved it over the 20 years. And I think when I look to the future, what I'm seeing now from where I'm sitting, running a school of sustainability, is all of the discussions we now have with, say, city mayors, and we, we work very closely with the Pittsburgh um, mayor's office, look to a future where they see more crises in their own environment. So Pittsburgh's a city that's subject to flooding. Uh, it used to have some of the worst pollution in America. Back in the 60s, you could set fire to the rivers around here. You know, that was your evening's fun, but it's cleaned up a bit, a lot in fact. But when we look to the future of Pittsburgh, we want to build a much more resilient city. And there's two parts to that. One is having a way to respond to crises when they happen and making sure you protect your population. And that affects really the sphere standards. And then the second bit is understanding that that moment of crisis is an opportunity for change and an opportunity to build a more... Uh, and we're seeing that happen already. Some of the cities on the east coast of America, when they got hit by the last major cyclone, decided they no longer wanted to have a normal electricity system, if you like. They wanted to move to microgrids 
where they control their own sources of electricity, whether these are offshore turbines or wind turbines or, or solar power. Those cities that shifted to microgrid haven't had a power outage in the last two to three years which is just unheard of across the country. So it's that combination, I think, of being able to respond in times of crisis, understanding that that's an opportunity then that you're opening up for change, and that truly Sphere is global. It applies as much to the citizens here in Pittsburgh as it does to the citizens in Mogadishu, and I think that's something we should be justly proud of. Well, that's an interesting way for it to um, perhaps inform President Trump of his obligations under the Sphere standards. Well, I'm off to vote as soon as I've finished. <laughs> Won't tell you which way I'm voting. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter, for joining us um, remotely, and to you, Christine, for those reflections. And we are now going to turn to a short video to introduce um, the standards a little bit more um, to those of you who are newcomers and highlight what's new in in this handbook. And while we're watching the video, if I can ask my um, fellow panelists to join me on stage. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks, Christine. Imagine you find yourself in the middle of a crisis, a flood, a drought, an earthquake, or a war. Where do you start to help those around you? To not just survive, but to thrive and recover with dignity. How will you know if you're doing the right thing at the right time? For 20 years, Sphere has helped the humanitarian sector to think about these questions and then distill that experience in the Sphere Handbook. The handbook's cornerstone is the Humanitarian Charter. It expresses a shared commitment to relieve suffering and provide assistance, based on need alone, without discrimination. It recognizes that people have the right to assistance, to life with dignity, to protection and security, and to fully participate in decisions related to their recovery. The Sphere Handbook translates these principles and rights into practice. It sets out agreed minimum standards which are supported by clear actions. This framework is updated every few years to reflect new learning based on the experience of frontline workers. Each chapter brings to life the fact that people affected by crisis are at the heart of their own recovery. The 2018 edition of the Sphere Handbook reflects their realities. With most people now living in cities, it includes guidance on working in dense and quickly changing urban contexts, as well as rural areas. The handbook also discusses different ways to reach the standards, including cash-based assistance, market support, distribution, services, or technical assistance. Today, people are displaced by crisis for longer and longer periods. Humanitarian response on a long time scale requires strong coordination with different actors for sustainable recovery. New indicators help users to review and adapt their activities to meet needs as situations and people's own priorities change. Sphere can help you learn more, take action, and connect with others doing similar work. Principled humanitarian response, built on quality and accountability, promotes human dignity wherever and whenever crisis strikes. Join us to learn more and share your own experience. Okay, so with that introduction, we're going to now try to delve into a little bit um, how this works in the field, uh, what some of the challenges are, and how um, the sector can improve in trying to apply these standards in its day-to-day -day work. So I'm going to start with um, Jagan Chabagain, who is on my right, uh, Under Secretary General for Programs and Operations at the International Federation of the Red Cross. Is it working now? No. One, two. Okay, there we go. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I, will, I will not lean back. 
<laughs> sorry, Dragon is Under Secretary General at the International Federation for Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, which housed Sphere for some 15 years, if I'm not mistaken, um, and has a long history of working with the IFRC, both at HQ and in the field. Um, he was the Secretary General's Chief of Staff, uh, was Regional Director for Asia and the Pacific, uh, Head of Operations for Asia Pacific, Head of Regional Delegation for Central Asia, so quite a vast experience. And I wanted to start, Dragon, by asking you about um, how, uh, I think it was Peter who mentioned earlier that you know ultimately the responsibility lies with states. How are states using these standards, if at all? And, and what are some of the challenges in, in what are often very politicized environments um, where you know, some countries may not want to have a flood of refugees on their territory, for instance, in getting them to bother with these kinds of standards? Uh, thank you very much. And I think, uh, really thank you for uh, starting this conversation with this question. Because this is an uh, extremely important question for me in this, in this discussion. When we are talking about the standards, is the humanitarians coming together uh, and, and trying to bring the accountability in what we plan to do or what we do. But we need to put this in the global context. You know, we are not the only actor. When something happens in any country, humanitarians are not the only actor. And as Peter mentioned in his interventions before, the primary responsibility of protecting the citizens lies with the government. It's their primary responsibility. So we need to put our action and our standards in that particular context. And a lot of times we miss that aspect. You know, we come up with ideas, fantastic ideas, great ideas, and five years down the line and the ten years down the line, not much has happened because we haven't sufficiently considered the role of the principal actor in, in that country. So very, very important question uh, to, to, to start this, this conversation. The second, before I come to that, uh, this question, I also want to put, we also need to put this into the context of many other global initiatives that's happening. Huh? Uh, you know, a lot of the issues that came out of the old humanitarian summit. Huh? Uh, and I'm, I'm bringing this because in the, in the current context of, of Indonesia, where I was there just, just last month, and I know there have been divided opinions, you know, some have heavily criticized the stance of the, of the, of the Indonesian government, while others are more sympathetic to what, what they have done. The, the, of course, the, the one of the big things that came from the World Humanitarian Summit was localization. You know, we wanted the local actors and the local government to take, be in charge. And suddenly when they start doing that, we panic. Mm. And that's one aspect to put into context of these standards in that context also, what is happening with those, those initiatives. Now coming back to the government, I mean, for us in, in the Red Cross, this is extremely important because our member national societies are auxiliary to their government on the humanitarian action. So our relationship with the government becomes extremely important to be able to provide that auxiliary role in the country. And maybe just to give you an example, one, one big thing that we have done for the last number of years and some of the colleagues are in the room, like David Fisher here in the room, Victoria in the room, a big investment we made on what we call the International Disaster Response Law, and then now much more the disaster laws domestically. And one of the main purpose of that investment was try to bring the legal framework in the countries, which also includes the standard. Mm -hmm. A lot of times going and talking about the standards ourselves as humanitarian actors of the NGOs and throwing all these numbers frankly means nothing for the government if they are not part of their legal framework. So close to, close to 40 countries actually we have engaged through this, this initiative, of course also partnering with other organizations including UNDP and others, try to influence the legal frameworks in the country. And Indonesia is one of those countries where we have engaged very, very, very closely with the government also with the whole ASEAN as a, as, a, as a network, but also with the, with the Indonesia as a government. And the Indonesian government actually just last year introduced their, uh, their legal framework, the SOPs on the, on the emergency response framework, and that was supported by us through the, through the, the, through the IDRL program. Huh? So 
The, the, the point I wanted to make here is that it's extremely important to engage with the governments to influence their legal framework and inst constitute the standards within the legal framework in the, in the country. That will be sustainable, the government will want it, mm. and this will make the life of the organizations a lot, lot easier. The one other initiative we have, we have taken last year was really help government look into their existing legislation. Sometimes what we learned was changing the legislation in, in a country is a very, very heavy exercise. And of course, we come from the humanitarian aspect and really from the disaster angle, but when the government starts legislating, suddenly 10 or 12 different ministries get involved because the, you know, the legislation touches various ministries and departments. So it becomes a very, very heavy exercise. So we came up with the checklist actually to help the government to look into their existing legislation and see, okay, where are the gaps? And start building from there. And one of the questions on that checklist is exactly about the standards. Are these standards included in your legislation? Mm. If not, what can you do and how can we possibly help? <laughs> from the knowledge point of view. So this is a very important area of work, and I believe if we want to move forward, uh, or we go to the next phase, I hope we will have more time to discuss the, the future of this fair. For me, the governments will be one of the key stakeholders to take this fair standards to a next level. But when you look objectively as much as you can at what that actually looks like in practice, and yes, absolutely, humanitarians say all the time uh, we want to let local institutions lead and local governments lead, and yet the moment they do, everyone complains. But if you look at the quality of that response when it comes from the international humanitarian sector versus when it comes from a, a national government, in terms of these kinds of standards, how would you, uh, I mean, of course you can't compare, but where do you, how would you rate government performance, if I could put it that way? I think it's, it's probably we have to look into the context. Huh? I think the, the probably not every government are at the same level of, 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 of ensuring a certain quality of response, but that's, same, that's the same for the international organization also. Yeah. You know, I have I've been in the operations, you know, most of my time I have spent in the field. Uh, even the, the, the different agencies of the same organizations don't follow the same standards. Huh? So sometimes it's very easy to bash the local actors and the local governments, uh, but it happens for the international also. But it doesn't answer your question. No, that's, that's for me the, the, the pretty good. important element. Important element is the is, is the is the is the progress. Are we moving in the direction we should be moving? And one thing I like about the the the, the new handbook is it sort of accepts that element of progressive uh, change. Huh? I think that sometimes what happens is you know we set these global standards with however big consultation we have. This is still probably a thousand consultations. Huh? This. And, but it will still be seen as imposing a standard developed in Geneva or New York. So that progression and that using these standards as a tool to have that conversation, the dialogue, debate, and understand the local co uh, context and culture and influence the, the, the progress. I think that's where the, the, the real value comes. And I, I really think uh, the, the new version of the standards brings that element, and which I think is, is very, very important element. But ultimately, uh, it may take many, many years, the most sustainable standards will come from the local actors and the local governments, and us international playing the supporting role, ultimately. We are, are we there now? No, not at all. But that should be our direction. So while we're on the topic um, of localization, I'm going to turn to Nasra Ismail on my left. Uh, Nasra is an aid worker with 10 years of experience in international development in Africa, Asia, and Europe. I'm, I'm curious what the Europe bit is, but we can discuss that later. She's currently the deputy director of the Somalia NGO Consortium, which is uh, rather unique in combining both local NGOs and international NGOs working on Somalia and was previously Oxfam's country director for Somalia. Um, Nasr, on this question of, of localization, to what extent are local groups, whether they be NGOs or community organizations, actually using these standards? Are, are these standards accessible to them? And in this push towards localization, you know, often we hear um, that these kinds of standards can actually be a barrier to entry for local groups rather than an aid. So from your experience on the ground, how does it work? Can you hear me? No. no. Okay. 
Uh, thank you so much, and really thanks to Christina for the, for the uh, extension for the invite. I think it's always lovely to have uh, a mixture of uh, panelists here, and you've opened up very well with all the areas we wanted to talk about. We, I do work in an NGO fora that is mixed, um, which to be quite honest is almost on an everyday basis like working for um, a couple who are arguing. So you want to keep the marriage together, we need to have the local NGOs and the international NGOs in this fora, because quite frankly it takes all of them to deliver the work that we do in a context like Somalia. But with localization, we've had a rift in the relationship. Um, despite the efforts of the World Humanitarian Summit and others to actually make us better. I think in terms of the book and what I see on an everyday basis in Mogadishu, um, where I've been there now for almost a year, prior to that I was with Oxfam as their country director based out of Nairobi in, um, uh, for, for Somalia. I think the, the text is there, everybody's trained on it, the book is incredibly uh, used as a reference, but there is a, a negotiation that happens in country on what's appropriate on whether this standard becomes the only standard that we're all using or there are other standards driven by the context that need to be taken into account. Local actors are often the only ones who go to areas that are inaccessible, where it's actually quite literally not available, it's not, it's not sensible to have 20 liters of water. It's not sensible to, to reach this ambition in our standard book. It's much more about what you can get away with, what you can get funding for, what you are able to actually deliver in person. So I think in the context in the field, you have a negotiation between what is our standard, our aim. I like to call this fear our North, uh, North Star in terms of guiding us. But oftentimes in the field, you see some of the human flaws, some of the non-sphere standard um, attributes that get in the way of delivery good access is one of them, resources are one of them. And the last thing that I think makes the localization uh, process even more clear is that oftentimes you'll find international NGOs being the best at, yes, delivering this aid against standard, and their counterparts at the local level quite frankly don't have any idea. So I think in terms of bridging these two, we need to really think about this book, this standard being more accessible, not just language, but it's an interpretation and it's flexibility. Um, in 2016, 2017, I remember I took my team, the engineers, as you all know, the WASH guys, making sure that my leadership could understand what was happening in the Horn of Africa in 2016, 2017. We we're one of four countries that was looking to face a famine, or actually was facing a famine, uh, not, not in the political terms, but in reality, in terms of the numbers, people in need, people displaced, people without water. And we did come upon this source of water. It was uh, probably a 120-year-old source of water, a, a natural spring. So in our team, we had this probably a four-hour debate on whether we stick to the standard, clean the source of water, provide it to the people and the animals who are using it, or for better uh, understanding of the context, actually leave it alone because we're coming up against our do-no-harm uh, do no principle. And we ended up after two days actually walking away and saying the sphere standard has a way to engage uh, us in the right thing to do against the standards that we've all been trained in, but this local context, this particular well, uh, excuse me, natural spring, dictated by religious, by very context-driven uh, values, is actually not to be touched because in, immediately if something should happen, we would be run out of the country. So I think for us in the field, we do end up tr making trade-offs. We do uh, think through the gaps in the areas where perhaps we're not as a humanitarian aid sector able to deliver everything at standard, but what can we deliver in this context given the barriers that we have, but also given the other standards that may not be in a book but are in the people uh, that are living the day-to-day -day lives where we're supposed to support. When you said the local counterparts had no idea, what, what did you mean? I think for, for, for us what we see is uh, the references are there in the donor and in, in the proposals and the documentation. But when I walk up to our local partners, and again I work for a you know 80 plus NGO uh, fora with many types of local organizations, many types of civil society, people are aware in terms of the reference, but people may not be able to tell you uh, truly how to uh, deliver these aid in the best way. So I think in reality the implementation of it is devoid of the sphere standard. Mm. Uh, but in the, in the writing of it, in the accountability to donors, in the incentives behind proposals, it's referenced throughout. But there's a clear, oftentimes, break between application, implementation, and reference. And this point that there are other standards that might not be in what the humanitarians might consider the Bible, uh, but that guide local practice, to what extent, in your experience, is that understood and respected by the international humanitarian community? 
I think, I mean, in a place like Somalia, uh, obviously we feel like we've trained many humanitarians to do the kind of work that is acceptable in Somalia, and that in terms of the fragmentation of governments, in terms of the expectation that we have, in terms of access to communities where there are many other members available, you're not always getting to doing the right thing at the right time, at the right level. Um, the negotiation, this is what I mean about negotiation, this is what I mean about the local context having its own standard and, and really looking at this not just as a tick-off process, but as a guide to make sure that where we have access we can actually deliver it. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I guess I mean, uh, you know, when, when you turn to some of the donors that are funding that work and say, look, no, we didn't follow the sphere standard because the reality on the ground was X, Y, and Z. We're not operating in, I mean, let alone, um, the United States, but even a refugee camp in Jordan which would would be a much easier operating environment than in remote parts of Somalia, and this is what we, this is what makes sense for our delivery. What kind of reaction do you get? I think if you ask many NGOs and those we work with, you get a variety of answers. One, you assume that that level of honest conversation is happening. Uh, I think it's much like localization, much like some of the issues we're having in terms of safeguarding. You assume that we are having this conversation with our donors and we're actually looking at how we prepare our response plans, how we prepare our contingency plans, ensuring that there is that gray area that we can be quite open and accountable to. But I think oftentimes it just doesn't. It just doesn't happen. I wish, I pray, that we will have those kinds of conversations so that it's not just about sphere, but it's sphere plus human intellectual uh, uh, thought. It's, it's, it's the, this thing plus the standards that are unrecognized that really drive our day-to-day -day success in Somalia, which means sometimes we're not able to meet the needs of all people and we have to make trade-offs. I'm going to turn to James on that note about trade-offs <laughs> because um, James, many of you will know, has um, some experience watching these trade-offs happen. Uh, he has a background in international law but has worked in the, well, I don't know why I said but, um, and has worked in the humanitarian sector for the last 25 years um, and also has a history with Oxfam, was Oxfam's humanitarian um, programs director in East and Central Africa in the 1990s. Um, also worked in the Balkans, in the Middle East, and South and East Asia, um, and uh, also has a kind of policy background having led the humanitarian policy group at the Overseas Development Institute uh, in London for some time. But I came to know James um, in his current role, which is in, in doing evaluations of humanitarian response um, for donors and, and for others in, um, in some cases, I think, the aid agencies themselves, although um, not always. Um, and so uh, we had a conversation, I think some years ago now, when you had just finished doing an evaluation on the response in Syria, in which you said very clearly to me, the humanitarian system has failed. And I wonder how you square what happened in Syria with this kind of discussion around standards. Do they help solve the problems that caused the system to fail in Syria? Uh, wow. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to apply them to Syria. What I, what I would say, and not because they don't apply, they apply everywhere, but that they, the practical challenges and the policy challenges, the political challenges are so enormous. If I may, I'll answer it by going back a bit and then coming forward. So. Um, I'm one of those who remembers life before Sphere, um, and when I entered the humanitarian sector, it was in the guise of a kind of program coordinator. And the things, and the, the two sort of big formative crises that I, I remember most vividly were indeed the Rwanda uh, crisis, the subsequent to the genocide, the Rwanda refugee crisis, and particularly events in Goma and what was then Zaire, uh, and the Bosnia crisis. And, and two things stick in my mind and the mind of many of those who, who were involved in those. One is the sheer chaos um, of those situations. And the chaos, I'm afraid, applied to the humanitarian sector as much as anything. So it was chaos in a number of ways. It was rather arbitrary who showed up to deliver assistance. Mm. It was arbitrary what they delivered. People were delivering the same services but using completely different standards and so on. So there, there, was, a, there was a kind of chaos and, and sphere 
was an attempt to make less arbitrary uh, what was delivered on behalf of people and to provide some kind of a framework for accountability. Not a mechanism, but a framework, a thing against which they say, here's what we commit to doing on your, uh, for, to assist you. Um, that was an advance, and by the way, subsequently, I think we underestimate how much the standards help the process of building coordination platforms because with the advent of, of clusters and so on in, 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 the, in the 2000s, um, they came around, came together largely around that idea of common standards and so on. So I think Sphere helped crystallize the coordination processes that, that are part of what makes current humanitarian practice less of a circus, if I can use a derogatory term, uh, than it, perhaps it, it, it used to be. Um, but the other thing that, that I remember from that time was what those crises taught us about the limits of voluntary humanitarian action. Mm. Um, there were things we could do for people and there were things we couldn't. And above all else, we couldn't protect them. And that was true in, in, in the Rwanda case, it was true in the Bosnia case, it's been true in many others. And it's so obviously true in Syria that it's, it's hard to, to overstate it. Um, one of the things we tried to do in the charter of the, of, of, for, for the humanitarian charter for Sphere, which is the bit that I, I was most involved with, um, was to bring together the uh, two sets of things. So we, the, there was this idea of indeed a right to humanitarian assistance, but we tried to put together a framework that brought, uh, if you like, the official and the voluntary sides of this together. To go back to what Dragon was saying, we talked about what were government's responsibilities and warring parties' responsibilities. So we looked at the international legal frameworks. We said, what are those obligations? How do they relate to our obligations as service providers? So in, in the charter, we, 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 we tried to marry, if you like, the, the voluntary uh, service provision concept with a bigger, in, in a bigger framework of accountability and responsibility. Um, but we also uh, tried to distinguish the, those two things. The accountabilities are different, and I'm I would absolutely echo what you said, Jagan, and what Peter said earlier. We must be careful not to take responsibility for things that are not our responsibility, and to locate that responsibility mm. where it belongs. One of the things I've seen sometimes in Syria, also in South Sudan, where I've been recently with UNICEF, is that we treat as a matter of operations and practicality and bureaucracy what is actually a protection issue. Mm. So the, denial, the consistent denial of access to populations that are in, in need, and I mean horrendously so in, 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 in Syria and Yemen and South Sudan and so on, um, disgracefully so. It's absolutely a matter of protection, not simply something you negotiate your way, you try to negotiate your way through by getting the necessary permits, although you have to do that too. And I think part of what we, we tried to do in, in, in the Charter was to say there is a wider sphere of accountability here. And whatever we do, and I've had this conversation with UNICEF in South Sudan, in substituting, if you like, for state responsibilities, don't forget that ultimately, they're the ones accountable. And if you don't help build that sense of accountability, if you don't strengthen, if you like, the social contract and work towards building that political contract, then as you said, Jagan, five years down the line, 10 years down the line, we will still be here doing the same thing. It's absolutely crucial that we build that sense of political accountability. We tend to talk about our own accountability to people, and so we should, and Sphere provides a good basis for it. But it's secondary, frankly, to the more fundamental accountability relationship between a people and its government. But what is the role of humanitarians in then pushing for that wider political accountability? Well, uh, it, 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 it's, it's partly a matter of how you go about providing your own assistant and who you do it with. Um, and, and so, that, I mean, there are local, as you said, I mean, local networks of accountability that are, that are important here. So it's how you do it, who you, who you work with, and within what structures you work Work. And of course, it's about advocacy and it's about not being afraid to say there's a political realm of responsibility here which if it is not tackled will leave these people exactly where they are. Mm. We have to name it, not take the whole responsibility for this situation on ourselves because we can't and shouldn't. So it's partly about advocacy. Now, the, the, Sphere helps provide some basis for that, both in terms of the principles, but also in terms of whether people are getting the basics 
for what they need. And if they're not, and you can demonstrate that, for example, you can't meet the sphere standards in a given area because pe people are being denied access to assistance, you've got a pretty powerful tool, especially if the government itself has, in principle, signed up to the same standards. We've used, we used it in Sri Lanka, and I'm sure it's been used elsewhere for similar purposes. And if I remember correctly, that was one of the conclusions of the evaluation of the Syria response, which was that the aid agencies stayed quiet about abuses by the government because they wanted to maintain their access, and that they were, in so doing, complicit in some way. Yeah, there was a big, a big. Uh, there have been and continue to be big debates about this. Not unique to Syria, but it came out really strongly in Syria, and there was a big divide between the NGOs and the UN on this. I mean, that's a bit crude, but, but the UN agencies working out of Damascus were were said by some to be complicit, if you like. With, um, that's too simple a view. Um, I've given some some of our colleagues a hard time in the UN and elsewhere for not, I think, pushing hard enough mm. on access. But somebody had to be there, somebody had to work with the government, somebody had to get access. It's a tough call. Well, the ICRC does this the whole time and it's a really tough job. You've got to, uh, you've got to be honest enough to, to maintain that pressure. And of course, a lot of that pressure is ha happens not in the public eye, it happens uh, behind closed doors and needs to sometimes. So I d I'm not sure the UN has always done enough in that regard. Um, the NGOs for, the, for their own part haven't always done enough to um, remain impartial in their, their own aid delivery, actually working across lines and so on. So, so it's, not a, it's, it's not a simple uh, matter. Um, but I think overall um, it's fair to say there have been significant failings on that score and holding people to account mm. that both in the humanitarian sector and more importantly in the wider uh, political sphere um, and we're, we're all aware I think of how that looks in terms of state uh, uh, advocacy. I'm just trying to make sense of, you know, if, if you are a humanitarian working in Syria under those conditions and with all those challenges and the limits of your sphere of influence are very clear. What is your advice as someone who, you know, studied that response and, and identified what went wrong in terms of if your interest is to improve the response to those in need in a context as complicated as Syria, where are the entry points to uh, upholding the standards is, is too high a bar perhaps, but to improving the response in the areas where it could have been improved but wasn't? Mm. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a combination of things. Um, part of it is, is, is just about being sufficiently present. Um, we, we, we haven't talked much about this, this, this tendency trend towards sort of remote programming and remote management. But part of the difficulty with being remote is that it's actually very difficult, um, first of all, to, to, to really understand what's happening to people. Uh, second of all, to ensure that the programs you're delivering or are being delivered in your name are actually delivering to the, the standards you need. And there's sometimes a trade-off, and I understand it, and I've been there, between getting coverage and getting quality of response. These are sometimes difficult uh, decisions to be made. One of the things that Sphere does is give, is, is, is if you like, forces to be honest with ourselves, or should, when we're failing to, to, meet, to meet those standards. Um, but I think, you, in, especially in a conflict situation, you are always operating in a negotiated space, in a compromised space. You have to just keep pushing the limits of that without fundamentally compromising your own activities. And this is often debate within organizations. Are we pushing hard enough or too hard? Will we be, I mean, there's a constant fear of being thrown out, particularly if, conflict settings, perhaps overstated sometimes, frankly, um, and perhaps the joint advocacy uh, uh, by the humanitarian country team and so on isn't always as strong as it ought to be, and I would say that's probably true in the Syria case. Nasser, I wonder how you react to the, uh, in particular on the question of remote delivery, because you were, you know, identifying some of the, the challenges of sticking to the standards, but the standards can also be helpful, I suppose, in 
guiding action in areas where uh, the kind of mainstream system isn't present? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, before I get there, I think we've all, all three of us have located the importance of keeping governments accountable um, and making sure that they do take on the work that we are either doing or hopefully will um, cease to do as we get sustainability on on, uh, on our, you know, check-off list. Um, Somalia, I think as now everybody knows, stands to be obviously without a, a, a fully functioning government for longer term than two years, let's say in the last 30 years. Um, about 40% of the GDP is accounted for by international donor aid and much of it humanitarian. Um, another probably 40-50% is also re remittances. So I think there's a real um, sort of discussion to be had about locating that responsibility and the expectation that they will take this work on. At least in Somalia, the NGOs continue to play a critical role and have been doing so probably for 40 years to be really honest. So it's going to take a long time not just to locate the responsibility but to transfer that responsibility as well. And I think Sphere is one of those uh, crucial guidelines where it is, when we talk about localization, the government is also part of that uh, local uh, uh, network and fora. Um, I think in terms of remote management, because of the security concerns and the security issues in Somalia, yes, many of the international NGOs have been based and operating out of Kenya. And so it has meant oftentimes a really unique dialogue between um, international NGOs, between the communities, between local civil society to say, yes, where I can go, you can go. Where I can go fully, you can help where I can go uh, with the most you know, money that I have, you can actually have better access uh, in terms of culture, in terms of expectation, in terms of um, social indices. But what you come up against, and I, I feel like we're all repeating ourselves, but yes, is trade-offs and being okay uh, to provide something in a consortia, to provide support in a group setting and not just one INGO after another. Um, we are seeing a change, though. Um, this particular government in Somalia has been mainly filled with diaspora, mainly filled with people who actually come and have been trained under the, in, in the NGO sector. So we're actually being asked, as we speak, to relocate fully from Kenya to Somalia. Different kinds of issues are going to come up. We're hoping that we get some uh, connection in terms of proximity to community, which has been a very important thing for NGOs and, and community. Um, obviously, it can also uh, have more barriers in terms of, well, where will funding come from if we move into a country that is more insecure? Are we going to cut that money from the programs? And it's looking like it actually will. So really interesting with remote management, whether you're gaining more or actually you're losing something. Hmm. Jagan, I wanted to ask one more um, difficult or, or ask you to be honest um, in your answer um, and then turn to the audience. But the national societies, I mean, we've been talking a lot about localization in this context. How do they use the standards? And and perhaps how, how closely do they uphold the standards? Um, this is again, bit, I think, a bit similar to the governments. Huh? Uh, you know, the national societies, when we look at the Red Cross, uh, Red Cross societies, some of them, they have a practice of 150 years, uh, some of them 100 years. So they, they have had a long history of practice on how they have been doing certain things. And because they come locally, of course, there are many local practices. I think, as, as you mentioned in Somalia, you know, many, many local practices. Having said that, I think because in the last uh, 20 years journey, um, and, and having worked in the field for, for so many years, the, the SPEAR has become uh, a tool which, which, which many national societies use now. Huh? Will they fully use all the numbers and indicators? Not. But SPEAR is used as a tool to have that conversation, to, to compare some of the some of the some of these standards with what they have been doing, and try to constantly aspire to, to to improve and change. And from the international federation, this is one of the key uh, key engagement we have with our membership in in, in, in program design, in program planning, uh, in you know a lot of investment we make in the capacity building work of the of the local Red, uh, Red Cross education societies. The quality and accountability is one of the one of the most important element of our engagement with the, with the national society, and and we have seen this seen this progression now. For example, you know, if, if we are doing any emergency appeal now, the, the one of the key questions to be considered is is this fair standards being looked into? Hmm. Uh, can this be applied? If we allocate any emergency fund from our uh, disaster relief emergency fund, that question is asked. Now, do we meet everywhere? No. 
we don't. But have we seen constant progress in the last 20 years? Absolutely. A, a, a huge progress there. So it has become a tool the National Society feel comfortable with, uh, feel very comfortable discussing and trying to uh, trying to incorporate them into their own, own local standards. And they feel ownership over them? Uh, yeah, very much. Oh, very much. Uh, and in actually, many of the countries, the, 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 the National Societies are one of the key players to champion the spirit standards with other NGOs uh, in, in, in those countries. Um, but a lot to do. Well, I mean, if, if this is the future, right, that the response in Syria will be led by, among others, the Syrian Red Crescent, yeah. what is your biggest concern? I mean, the, the biggest concern for me is maybe twofold. One, we talked about it a lot, but a lot of times, you know, we are trying to solve a political problem with the humanitarian solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the city, and I think you described very, very well, is a lot of times, the, you know, the, somehow the humanitarians haven't done it. You know, the, somehow humanitarians haven't achieved it. Well, there's nothing the humanitarians can do. And I have also seen the situations, you know, the government sort of transferring money and the risk of doing action in Syria, but sitting in the Security Councils and taking exactly the opposite decision, which actually increases the risk of delivery of the humanitarian assistance in the country. So that is one big concern is that there can never be a humanitarian solution to political problem. Humanitarians can help, can, can, can reduce some of, the, uh, some of the pressure, can improve some of the dignity uh, of, of the people, but the solution cannot come. So in the context of Syria, I think that is really uh, you know, the, the one, one big element to keep in mind. And I think as humanitarians, uh, I think that humility we need to learn. I know sometimes some of the languages we use, we feel like oh, we can solve all the problems of the world, you know. And honestly, we don't. Uh, so that humility, but also, of course, uh, you know, I'm not saying that we should not articulate what we have been doing and the changes we are, we are making, but we definitely need that humility that there is only this much the, the, the humanitarians can do. And I think that is very valid uh, in, in, in case of Syria. The, just before the Syria crisis started, you know, the Syrian Arab Red Crescent was a relatively small organization in the country. I mean, they were doing a good job, but they were definitely not at the scale of delivering this type of assistance. And within a year, they would, you know, I think the first year, second year into the crisis, they were delivering almost 80% of the UN assistance was delivered uh, by the Syrian Arab Red Crescent. With a lot of question marks around yeah, it. But still, they were the only one. That, uh, I think they were probably, if there were other rooms, probably people would not have used the Use the, use the Syrian, uh, Syrian Arab No, I think in this case the government required people yeah. to use the Syrian Red Crescent, so yeah. there wasn't much choice in the matter. Yeah. So, uh, but the 20% did go with others, so so it was not only Syrian Arab Red Crescent which was delivering. Huh? Uh, and then increasingly now that percentage is not the same, so 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 the, the, what Syrian Arab Red Crescent is delivering is not even 50% now. So it means clearly there are others uh, who, are, who are also delivering. But the, the, the critical element there is how do you balance the politics, security dimensions of that crisis versus, as you rightly said, somebody needs to be there to be able to do at least minimum that is, that is required for, uh, for, uh, um, yeah, for, for basic human dignity for the people who are, who are affected by the crisis. I think in, when it comes to Syria, the the incredible work the many partners did with the, with the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, of course the ICRC very much on the lead uh, to, to work, to, to, to bring some of the standards in the conflict situation, and ourselves trying to bring some of those standards in, 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 in the capacity of the Syrian Arab Red Crescent to deliver some of the goods in a way that is, that is optimal, I would say. Let me use the word optimal in that, in that particular context. But also in the context, where the security has become such an issue, and I think a lot of times this is not talked about, you know, more than 75 of the Syrian Arab Red Crescent volunteers have been killed mm. uh, when, when they have delivered this assistance. So of course, sometimes, I mean, as you indicated, they get criticized for this or that, but 75 of them have lost their life. And they haven't stopped trying to go to these difficult places, not single week, 
So we, we really need to put all that into context. And, and to be very honest, sometimes I'd like to challenge that which of the international organizations would have continued to stay in Syria and continue to deliver that aid, even if they have lost five people, not 75 people. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I, uh, I don't mean to um, pick on the Syrian Red Crescent in particular, but rather this is the future, that, that it is these kinds of groups that will be leading humanitarian response in these very difficult contexts. And we need to start thinking that through in a little bit more detail and understanding the, both the challenges and the benefits of that. I wonder if, if some of the donors in the room would be interested in just feeding into this discussion because um, you know this is a great case study of where donors are very uncomfortable in channeling money through um, through uh, not only the Syrian Red Crescent, but other groups on the ground in Syria where the, uh, you know, there are quote unquote question marks around their impartiality, their neutrality, their capacity, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the, the kind of the narrative that always comes back when we talk about um, localization. It's, well, the, we don't know that they can uphold standards. We don't know that the quality will be there. So would anyone in the room just want to kind of feed back on that to help us um, think through how how, how does this new world unfold from a donor perspective? I'm, I'm looking at Thomas and Dylan, and who else is here? <laughs> Thomas, you are of the German mission. Yeah, thank you very much, Heba. Thanks uh, to the panel. Uh, first of all, let me say a word of congratulation uh, to Sphere to the launch of this uh, handbook. Um, I think it's a great achievement. Uh, you managed to bring together, um, I think, uh, 650 practitioners from 300 organizations over a period of two years to work on this on this revision. It's it's really a, a great uh, job, and Sphere has become uh, a brand. It's not just a name. It's it's become a brand. Uh, for the whole community and, and beyond. Um, yes, and uh, I just uh, wanted to briefly refer to the, to the donor role on this. Um, Germany does not have a strict uh, um, conditioning of um, aid um, with any form of standard or uh, as, a, like a, as a precondition or entry ticket or something, but uh, for, for sure enough, we, we do um, some, um, we lo look at the organizations, how they work, and, and from the reporting we receive, we can see whether the standards have been applied and in which ways, but it's not a, like really a strict uh, relationship uh, between uh, standards. Uh, for sure we look at results, um, but we are, um, according to context, um, also flexible on how to inter interpret the, the application, and this has come up in the discussion here uh, as well. So um, thanks again, and we were happy to support uh, this revision of the handbook. Any other reactions? Yeah, sure. UK. Um, thanks, Heber, and uh, thank you very much to the panelists, and also congratulations to 20 years. Um, and I think uh, the discussion is really interesting because it, it, obviously the use of Sphere has evolved. I, I headed up DFID's Humanitarian Emergency Response Group uh, about five years ago. We set uh, Sphere as a criteria for agencies that we would fund in a rapid onset environment where we didn't necessarily have the time to do due diligence. And Sphere was a really helpful thing for us to guarantee to our ministers that there was some kind of quality assurance uh, and that we were looking at value for, for money, we were looking at the things that our taxpayers would also believe are important. I think as, from a donor perspective, accountability is not just about the beneficiaries, it's also about taxpayers. And then there's a lot of arguments in our countries about you know, diverting aid to domestic priorities. And I think things like the safeguarding uh, issues that came up recently were a really big issue. But because we are now talking about standards and, and, and how we tackle this as a community, we are still able to protect our aid budget. So I think, I think you know, in the past, there has been uh, very much a sort of, yes, the sphere standards are the kind of ideal thing. We will assess our proposals against those. We will fund you because of the, because of the criteria that sphere, sphere sets out. But I think we live in a much more complicated world now, and that's what, what you've talked about. And I think you know, there is this, this question mark as sphere standards being the benchmark. We've got things like cash, of course, which, which change the way in which you, people might operate, and it's great to see that the, the Sphere stand, uh, handbook now includes cash. Um, but I think it will be more of a dialogue on, on, on 
some of these standards, particularly where you have very uh, limited access. You know, should you give no aid if you can't reach these standards, or, or should you continue to give aid? I think the whole localization piece is, is quite interesting, and it may be that there are there are different uh, things that people are, are needing as opposed to, to, to you know what aid agencies are delivering. And I I think the final piece on all of this, is, of course, is, is as you said, there's the political situation. It's governments, and you know one of the one of the discussions I was involved with the uh, common humanitarian standard a few years ago, and one of the discussions with that was can we can we get governments to use the standards themselves as well, or, or CHS, and can we get them to sign up and uh, particularly for those agencies that are delivering aid within your country, can you say no? I don't want that NGO because you, you know you're you're and this came out of Haiti actually I think quite a lot of it, but you know I don't want you because you're not really delivering the right thing. So it's very context specific. I think we do need, do need to have a discussion. I think uh, the, the sphere standards will will carry on for the next 20 years, I'm sure. But I also think that the media, Hebrew, and you may be able to answer a question on this. You know, how does the what's the media engagement on this? Social media, uh, the whole the whole way in which the the, the digital um, in, information flows are changing the way in which people are demanding uh, different services. So I think there are some question marks that we probably don't yet have answers to. And I'm again pleased that Christine talked about these issues as the future for fear, for fear. So it didn't really answer your question, but uh, it's a complicated subject. Thanks. <laughs> no, it's interesting to hear that you you see the standards as potentially a tool to protect aid budgets. If I interpreted that right, to say we have a guarantee that certain standards are being met as a way of pushing back against some of those that might have less interest in, in aid being delivered, but you can obviously see how the flip side could also um, be at play. In terms of media, I mean, I think we, um, we were talking about this earlier with James, actually, that the, the landscape in which humanitarian aid takes place today is one in which there is probably, in some cases, more scrutiny by the media, and in some cases, less, actually. Um, I think, you know, 20, 30 years ago, many of the conflicts in which aid agencies would be present had big media presence as well. And today, um, it's much harder to cover, to, to be present as a journalist as well on the ground in Syria and, Yemen. or Yemen or CAR. Or, and so in many contexts, actually, humanitarians are operating without that additional layer of accountability that media would otherwise provide. Obviously, we as Erin are trying to plug some of that gap and, and to add to the kind of ecosystem some independent um, voices of critique and some independent observers that can flag when standards are absolutely being um, being uh, not upheld, but it, it's one piece of a, of a messy picture and there aren't nearly enough of us out there trying to do this kind of work. Um, I thought I would turn, <laughs> Andy's like hiding in the back, to Andy Wiley uh, at the back of the room who's with the UN Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA. We've been talking a lot about this kind of collective accountability and the limits of standards and I wonder from your point of view, having worked on the humanitarian reform processes, um, the various humanitarian reform processes that have um, succeeded and failed in, in different instances, how you see the best tools to help the humanitarian system better deliver today. So, so how did you find me back here, Heba? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think over the past several years, we've really tried to unpack as a, as a humanitarian community this what this means about collective accountability. And some of it is, is about adhering to standards like SPHERE globally, but I think it's also about uh, at, the, at the crisis level, uh, coming to some kind of an agreement as a collective, what we're actually out to out to achieve, um, not just as organizations, but what are some of the the outcomes that we're uh, we're looking for, um, uh, you know, in terms of things like malnutrition or. Uh, um, waterborne diseases, etc. What are we? What are we actually going to be held accountable for achieving? And and in order to get to that kind of accountability, we have to try to agree where we're going as a collective, um, and then to be willing to uh, to report back, uh, share information on how we're doing. Again, not at the program level, but at uh, but at the outcome level. And um, 
when you look at the size of the, the humanitarian system, I mean, that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty big ask uh, to try and achieve that. But I think if, we, uh, if we're serious about putting affected people at the, at the center of our response, um, we, have to, we have to be willing in some way to come together around uh, that notion of a collective outcome that we're going to be held accountable for achieving. But what is that collective outcome shaping up to be? Because I, until now, I still don't really understand what the term is meant to mean. Well, I think that may I think that may change from one context to another. But what is a collective outcome? It's a it's an objective that you're uh, that you're working towards uh, achieving. And you know, in a given in a given crisis, that could be uh, uh, you know over over a period of three years, uh, you know, X percentage of IDPs are able to return. And and looking at what kinds of humanitarian interventions are necessary in order to achieve that, but also perhaps what longer term interventions that are kind of outside our sphere uh, of influence are, uh, are necessary to achieve. So I think it, it, it depends on the, on the context. Um, and so I think that's, that's where we have to, uh, again, we've got standards uh, like sphere, but then we have to, uh, based on context, be flex flexible enough to, to uh, decide what we're out to achieve as a collective. And that, and that I think, does require, uh, you know, more dialogue across uh, shorter-term humanitarian interventions and, and some of the longer-term uh, development interventions. I see a few people smiling in, in response, and I'm trying to make sense of that. Thanks, Andy. Um, does anyone on, across the room have um, reactions to what you've heard so far, or um, in particular, suggestions for where uh, the community needs to go next? What are the gaps that, when we look at accountability to people who are affected by crises and standards and, and this wider discussion, um, the areas that the sector isn't doing so well um, on, apart from all the ones we've already discussed, and where, for example, Christine might concentrate her efforts in the next um, handbook revision. So I just welcome any, any comments from the floor. Yes, at the back. Uh, firstly, thank you. There were several references to working in negotiated spaces and uh, difficulty in getting access in the context of Syria. But I believe that also is going to be increasingly applicable in other types of disasters, including weather trigger disasters and even disease outbreaks. So, saving lives, the, the urgency to save lives, uh, needs-based response, you know, rights-based approach, then, of course, holding powers to account. Are there any exceptions to this rule? Are there any contexts which could be exceptions to this rule? And that's uh, Uni, by the way, one of the chapter authors that you saw in the video. Other comments or questions? Yes. Since you ask uh, what should be looked at in the coming decade, uh, I believe that corruption schemes in aid should be um, a focus on the reflection on accountability. Uh, we know now that 30% of aid is diverted to corruption. On the $177 billion a year, it makes a lot of, lot of, lot of money. And time has come to be less shy and to look at those corruption schemes in a very pragmatic manner. So I believe it should be a specific chapter in the next version. 30% diversion? Yes, this is a statement of Ban Ki Moon in 2012 at the high level accountability uh, conference. And since then, nobody has um, challenged the statement, and it's based on World Bank. I would, I would never challenge anything Ban Ki Moon says. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but I think often people underestimate the volume of financial transaction, uh, which uh, relate to corruption scheme and being specialized in the fight against corruption. I can tell you that there is a lot to do in that domain. Okay, so Jagan has just um, clarified that that's in overall aid and not humanitarian assistance in particular. Maybe I could throw that to you, James, because you were saying, you know, that back in the day, I, I didn't mention that James was actually involved in the creation of the standards and has been contributing um, to many of the kind of iterations along the way, including the humanitarian charter. And 
um, you, y your view was that, in fact, diversion used to be, you know, um, common practice and has been cleaned up much more in recent years as a result of these standards, among other things, if I understood you right. But how do you, how do you react to that comment? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure it has been cleaned up. Um, I, <laughs> Uh, uh, being clear, yeah, yes. I think your words were, we used to get away with all kinds of diversion. Well, n n not, not so much. There was, there, was, um, there was less scrutiny in some respects. There were certainly um, fewer expectations in terms of uh, legal compliance, uh, uh, and compliance with um, well a, a whole a whole bunch of, of, of regulations and policy expectations. So uh, uh, I think practice used to be um, uh, you, you could say looser uh, than, it, than it is now. You could say more adaptive, uh, more effective. I mean, one of the difficulties, and I know this from from uh, working with with Oxfam, is that some of the INGOs find it increasingly hard to operate in these environments um, effectively. Um, even the question of getting money into a country now because banks are uh, unwilling to, 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 to make transfers. It goes back to Uni's point, I think. Uh, so there are various things going on. One is it's increasingly hard for the INGOs to operate in these spaces as they used to. Um, it puts a greater premium on those local partnerships and their effectiveness and accountability, but we're a long way short of having invested, as you said, and as invested enough, and that will take time if we're able to achieve it to make those to make those work. There are accountability difficulties with sometimes, frankly, with with working in, in that way. Um, so I, I'm uh, it, it's work in progress. The landscape has. has changed um, uh, in some ways for the better, but the operating environment has become increasingly difficult. Um, I don't know how it looks from, from your perspective, Jagan. But... Um, I think actually, given the time, that it would be great just to hear some final thoughts from, from um, Jagan and, and Nasr, and then we'll wrap up and uh, turn over to Christine. Okay, I, I mean, maybe, no, I, I agree with you, uh, James, uh, what you said, and fully agree with, with, with Malika, you know, the how do we move forward. I think the, the, the maybe the one big thing is, a uh, lot of times when you talk about quality and accountability, somehow it equates with putting more rules and regulations and control. And, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, that doesn't always promote quality and accountability. And that's the part I think we need to be a bit careful. I think the humanitarian world is already far too bureaucratic and far too many spreadsheets. And I think in the name of accountability, if we add more spreadsheets and more rules and more regulations, that's not going to help. I was, I was in Palu in Indonesia a few weeks ago, and I was so jealous to see that little NGO called Old Kitchen. You know, just with poor people coming there with absolute new bureaucracy and delivering 10,000 meals to the people who needed to eat. So simple, and I was just remembering my volunteering days in the 80s, and I thought, God, if we could do that in Red Cross this way, I would be so happy. So, again, this is the balance we need to maintain. So the, 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 the bureaucracy doesn't equal accountability. Maybe my final word, and I think this question was asked before, and I had been, I had been thinking about you know, what could be for the future uh, of this pair, and I think Christine mentioned about the information. Uh, but I was reading you know, in, the, in, the, in the top page of the, of the handbook, and it talks about right to life with dignity. Mm? And that's sort of the, the key thing. And that, that you know, I reflected a lot on that. What is the meaning of right to life with dignity? Is it having 15 liters of water? Is it having a 3.5 square meter of space? You know, looking into some of the Syrian refugees who were doctors and professors and engineers, and now they are queuing in a 40 degree sun to get that 15 liters of water, does that provide dignity? Is that dignity? I don't know. Does this make his life better? Yes. Does it make the pain a little bit less? Yes. But does it provide that, that right to life with dignity? And this is where I think probably in the next person, I don't have the solution how to do it, but in the next person, we could look into much more that soft side 
of what creates dignity, not only the numbers of liters or square meter or square foot, but what constitutes, and definitely information is definitely one element of that. Information about yourself, information about your future, information about your family, loved ones, that clearly helps bring a dignity. But what could be some of those elements where it really talks about dignity? I think the sum of the four chapters we have, they definitely make your life easier. But dignity, maybe a little bit, but not, not enough. So that could be something to aspire for, maybe in the next 10 years, Christine, so. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I think why I echo everything that you all have said, and I think uh, inherent in all the questions you guys are asking is about failure and discomfort. Um, and I think the better as a system we get um, at understanding them, welcoming them, so that we can get to an innovative space where, yes, if the whole world turns into Syria, then we are ready. Um, that then I think that's the that's the right way to go. I was in uh, America at the time, I think 2007, 2008. Julian, you can correct me, but when the Wall Street crash came down and the housing bubble, uh, a lot. A lot of the innovation and creativity that came out of it is immense. Our failure in the humanitarian sector ends in scandals. It ends careers. It ends our ability to do good in a context that's changing. So I think for the donors in the room, for all of us, we've got to get better at figuring out where are the levels of, yes, uh, diversion of aid. We are uh, going to have to be comfortable with as we go in and educating our sponsor, educating our public uh, uh, entities who are donors. Uh, in my family, for almost 29 years, we've lived in America. We've given out remittances knowing some of the money is going to disappear. Uh, we go in with our eyes open. So I think in our sector, obviously humility is one, but also this ability to say, yes, we're going to have to figure out a way to be comfortable with some of the failures in the context that that essentially take lives. <laughs> when, when humanitarians are lost, we, we we're not necessarily reacting in the same way as when, yes, a sum of money goes missing. So I think we need to be really, really um, able to program in failure that is acceptable to all of us, not obviously the, the, the ones we talk about that end uh, in scandals, but ones that I think give away to innovation, give away to other actors coming in the sector. I think um, the uh, colleague in Ocho also pointed at the nexus. This fear is not just going to be for humanitarians, it's going to be for development actors. It's going to be for people who aren't necessarily going to work in IPC 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but who can work in long term and will make mistakes. So I think we've got to get better at discomfort all around. I welcome that because I think one of the challenges for us in the media is that it's not always easy to get a straight answer from humanitarians and that there's often this this tendency to want to put a, a rosy picture forward partly because of the pressure from donors to show that the aid is working, that there aren't any problems. And if we can all have a bit more of an honest conversation in which we can acknowledge that the situation is not perfect and that these are complicated contexts. Um, I think not only do you then um, kind of get at some of the questions that you were talking about, but also the public begins to understand that this, you know, they, when humanitarians are up on this pedestal, the fall from grace is pretty high. But when they understand, the, when the public understands that, you know, th these are difficult situations with trade-offs and imperfect solutions and so on, that you can, um, create a certain sense of empathy with the challenge that it is to, to work in these areas. So um, I think we in the, the media also have a role to play in that. Um, but you as humanitarians also uh, need to be willing to, to be honest. On that note, I'm going to hand back to Christine, and I hope we have done some justice to uh, looking at what seems to have been a genuine recognition of evolution of the standards, um, as well as some of the challenges that lie ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will have a few words, but I know that Jagan has a flight to Colombo this evening. He's flying to Sri Lanka in just a couple of hours and was gracious enough to accord us this time. So I would say thank you. If you need to uh, be on your way, that is very well understood. We have a small gift for you, which may help you to understand dignity. And I hope you'll understand when you open it. Um, it's a mystery. But um, I would like to thank each one of you for this really engaging conversation. And Jagan, 
Dragon, thank you so much. Um, safe travels, and we will talk soon. <laughs> this is exactly what we wanted to have for this afternoon's discussion and the launch of this handbook. It's a celebration of 20 years where we have progressed as a community in many, many ways. And I think what I take from this is we need to continue this conversation, not just about technical standards, not about technocratic and mechanistic approaches to using these tools, but really reflective practice. This is what James and I were talking about, being able to find the space where you understand the trade-offs, and they're not simply, well, we just have to get something done, but there's an intentional reflection of what those trade-offs may be, what the implications can be, and how you are going to be transparent about some of those questions. And I think that's a real challenge to all of us, but I must say, I see movement in that direction. I see conversations happening around not just evaluations that point to failure, but what were those decisions, how did we reach them, and how did we manage those realities in practice? And I think that's really where we have some tools at our disposal, but mostly a community where we have a greater willingness for that conversation. So with that, I think those were the highlights I take away from this. Uh, it's a continuing conversation, and want to thank you very much for being part of it. We have uh, an opportunity to have a celebratory 20th anniversary uh, reception with all of you and invite you to uh, join us. We also have a few new interesting uh, tools. We have the interactive handbook that you'll be able to play with a little bit and it is actually live on our site now, but you have a screen outside, as well as the French, Arabic, and Spanish translations on screens here if you'd like to have a chance to look through them. I have been told that it is now guaranteed and confirmed that the new version is on our app. So you have lots of different ways to share this, to explore it, and to make it your own. With that, Hiba, thank you very much. Uh, you've generated a, an amazing conversation. James, inspiring as always, and uh, charging us to continue lifting the bar. And Nasra, thank you so much for bringing that field reality, that reflection, and your own practice to share with us today. Thank you so very much. Thank you.